Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is John McLennan. Um, I'm uh, a, a senior research scientist at the Energy and Geoscience Institute and a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Utah. And I'm pleased to be doing the third in a series of seminars offered by the Energy and Geoscience Institute. And as you can see in the bottom from the logo, EGI has been around for 50 years. And for a large part of that time, um, um, a significant portion of EGI's portfolio has been dealing with geothermal energy. And in particular today, I'm gonna to talk about um, one of our current flagship projects, which is the Department of Energy's Utah Forge project. And within that project, um, um, we have done some stimulation, some hydraulic fracturing of, of a well. And I'd like to talk about that um, with you today. Now, th this hydraulic fracturing is not substantially different than what is done in oil and gas, but as you can see from the illustration at the right, the issue is, is the temperature. And as you can see in this diagram, the wells that we're dealing with are drilled to about 9,000 feet below the ground surface, and they have a temperature of, say, somewhere in the order of 420 degrees Fahrenheit, 230 to 240 plus degrees centigrade. And so this story is about hydraulic fracturing and uh, I'm indebted to the people shown on the front here um, and many, many other people who have collaborated with us to do this. So to put this into a little bit of a perspective, um, this is, is about uh, FORGE. FORGE is a Department of Energy project and it stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And it's de-risking something that is called enhanced geothermal systems. So to explain enhanced geothermal systems, let's just step back one step and talk about the conventional geothermal systems that we're all familiar with. Those are situations where you drill to a heat source, you have water or steam in place that can transport um, the heat that is present, and you have conductive fractures that can uh, convect this heat to the surface to a plant that can convert this thermal energy to electrical energy ultimately, or, or direct heat um, in, in some cases. And, and the figure at the right is courtesy of, of Joe Moore at, at EGI, and it is from Steamboat and, and in Nevada showing an actual fracture that constitutes the fracture for a productive geothermal system. Well, what happens if you don't have those three elements, all of those three elements, heat, fluid, fractures? Well, and this is going to be the case in many parts of the world. And so for um, almost five decades now, more than five decades now, people have envisioned uh, situations where you only have the heat present or you can drill to the heat and you can add the other two elements. You can add the fractures and you can add the working fluid to circulate through these fractures. So let's look at a conventional vision for uh, one type of enhanced geothermal system. And it's gonna be based on the well program that's shown in the right-hand illustration. And that shows a, an injection well that is drilled and that's shown as the blue well. And after the injection well is drilled, you can hydraulically fracture that well. And in this case, I'm only showing- Micro or macro would be okay? Uh, uh, let me just pause. Pause. This is uh, basically the topic. Jennifer, if you could just mute people. The big one, the manual one? Yeah, yeah. That's oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. What are you expecting about 40? Uh, at, least, at least 40. About 35? Yeah. 35. Yeah, maybe 35. Yeah. Because it's different than the feet in my it should be around probably 25, 35. Last one should be 35, around 35. I'm sorry, right? folks. I'll figure out how to mute. You don't need any photos of the. Oh, no, no. Okay, let's go back to that. So you drill an injection well. Um, and then uh, you hydraulically fracture the toe of that injection well. And why just the toe? Well, you, um, 
at, at least at the present time, we want to see where these fractures are growing. And so we're monitoring these fractures with micro seismic events, and we're seeing what the vertical height of those fractures are, go are going to be. And then the next step in that, and then the next step actually at the, the forge project is to drill a production well to intersect the micro seismic clouds and hopefully establish that you have a connection between the injection well and the production well. Um, and that's actually where we are at the present time on the forge project. We're at, at this very day, we're coring through a set of fractures that we've created that we'll be talking about. Ultimately in the future, you're gonna populate this uh, this with multiple fractures to create a heat exchange system, where in a commercial situation, you can inject cold water through the injection well. That cold water will travel through the natural fractures and um, it will reach the production well, flow out through the production well and go to some sort of um, or organic ranking cycle plant or, um, uh, or something similar to convert thermal energy to electrical energy. So let's just provide a little bit of background on the forge site. And as you can see, these are cores from the forge site. They're, they are uh, cores that uh, are spread out. So you have a 360 degree view of those cores, starting with granitic material or granitoid type material that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. And as we get deeper, we get more and more nice. John, equipment. is the is screen moving? I haven't seen the screen move. It's still showing slide one. Or is that just for me? No, I, I don't see the cause either. We'll start, we'll, we'll try that again. How's this? I see point one, drill injection well. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sid. Thanks, thanks all. I just, I, I got a little off track there. Um, and, and hopefully you can now see point two. Yes. Okay. So uh, I got rattled. Um, so we drill this injection well. You hydraulically fracture the injection well and you monitor where those fractures go. And then you drill a production well to intersect those, those fractures. And um, I, this is exactly where we are at, at, the, at the present time. Um, and we're just coring through those fracture zones or those anticipated fracture zones. And then subsequently in the future, you'll add more hydraulic fractures so you can circulate down the injection well, through the fractures, into the production well, and produce hot fluid to the surface that can be converted to an alternative form of energy. Now, this is at the forge site, the forge site being uh, located near Milford, Utah. And as we drill into the forge site, we drill through maybe 4,000 feet of alluvial material that's been shed from the mountains to the east. And then ultimately you reach a contact with rhyolites and go into granitoid material. And you can see this granitoid material in the illustration on, on the left-hand side. And as, as you move deeper and deeper in this well, you ultimately reach situations that are a little more mafic. There are, there are people that can talk to this much better than I, but this is the type of reservoir that you're dealing with, you know, much, much different from some of the sedimentary reservoirs that that where we are um, uh, used to dealing with. Uh, these, these granites have some interesting characteristics. And so the Ford site was the vision of the Department of Energy to uh, look at this venture to try and, well, not to try, but to uh, advance enhanced geothermal systems. And over the past five years or so, we've drilled six or seven wells um, to monitor the uh, seismicity as we grow hydraulic fractures. Now, so let's just walk through the wells. You can see that well, it's labeled 5832. That was the first well that we drilled in, 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 this, in this play, a vertical well to about 7,500 feet. And then that was followed by a shallow well. We were looking at, at the aquifers that are present. Um, um, it's non-potable water, so that's a real advantage of this site. And as you can see, it's relatively barren. There's no environmental conflicts that, that exist or alternate use. And so a, an ideal site, both from a thermal perspective and from a use perspective. 
After 6832, 7832 was drilled and we have some fiber optics in 7832. And then at that point, uh, we drilled some other monitoring wells, 78B and 5632. But in the meantime, we drilled the first of these inclined wells. This is the injection well, 16A 7832. And it started over here to the west and we drilled down and drilled this at an inclination of 65 degrees to the vertical. Um, oh, with a lateral extent, what have we got here? Of about 4,000 feet. Subsequently, we, and currently we are drilling well 16B, which is on the same pad and is gonna be 300 feet above this well. And we're just, as I said, right now, we're drilling to intersect the fractures that I'm gonna talk about subsequently. So the thing to remember with these wells and with these geothermal wells is the difference uh, and, and the complication of these wells is the temperature, you know, 200 plus degrees C. And that's not all that hot for geothermal, but it's hot enough that it makes a challenge for using conventional tools without some, uh, some difficulties. So to put this into perspective in terms of oil field scenarios, let's, let's look at this. This is a plot that shows temperature and degrees C versus pressure for a lot of oil field plays that exist. And you can see some of them are getting hot. Um, if, if we look at where forge stands, forge is relatively low pressure. It's just hydrostatically pressured, but it's getting towards the hot end. And as I said, with time, we will go hotter and hotter in these geothermal wells to increase the efficiency of our power production. So with that temperature comes a lot of challenges in terms of using oil field tools. And this is just showing some packers that where the um, elastomeric elements have been degraded because of the, of the temperatures. And this has provided us a lot of challenges in the forge program. The other thing that is kind of interesting, and I'm not sure it's problematic, is the potential difference between these granitoid type reservoirs and a conventional sedimentary reservoir. So if we look on the panel on the right-hand side, we see, we see the, the very good work by Ratterman and his colleagues that where uh, a, a lot of in-depth monitoring was doing. And this is just showing microseismic clouds. And as you look at these microseismic clouds, you can see very, very planar fractures that are created as multiple stages along the length of the wells that are drilled. And so there's a perception and, and it's, it, it, it has basis that in many of these wells, relatively planar, little interaction with natural weaknesses. Whereas if we look at the left-hand side, this is an actual outcrop of the granitoid reservoir that we're dealing with. You can see, even though it's been exhumed and there's been erosion, you can definitely see multiple fractures that exist. And the, one of the challenges and things we're trying to figure out is what is the role of these natural fractures? Can they be exploited? Are they problematic? do they actually give us a fracture with a different morphology than what we commonly see in oil and gas scenarios? And the answer is, we'll see. And, 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 and you can see yourselves. So there are some examples of uh, microseismic monitoring for geothermal wells that do show that natural fractures may have a role and that life is always more complicated than we think it is. So let's start from the left. The Fenton Hill project was in the Valles Caldera um, in, uh, north of Los Alamos, New Mexico. And this is a frack that was done in December, 1983, where there was an attempt to intersect two slightly inclined wells with a large, a large scale frack. Unfortunately, uh, an adequate uh, intersection did not occur. And frankly, that is one of the reason these days that we're going to more highly inclined wells drilled in the direction of the anticipated minimum principal stress. And with pilot fractures done first so that we can steer the second well towards the microseismicity. So Fenton Hill was a fantastic Pyrrhic victory in terms of geothermal science. But um, EGS sort of went to sleep for, uh, for a number of years until it was revived by the vision of the Department of Energy. About the same time as Fenton Hill, maybe, maybe a little later, but about the same time was Rose Manawi's in Wales. Now, the interesting thing about Rosemont Alley in Wales is that the fractures apparently, not apparently, but the indications for the fractures were that they grew downwards rather than upwards. And this is a function of local stress conditions that are always going to be controlling the fracture growth no matter where, where one is. 
Sult Suforet in, in, in the Rhine Graben um, shows more conventional behavior. Um, and Basel is an interesting is an interesting case because there was a seismic event that uh, had long-reaching consequences in terms of um, establishing um, safety measures for uh, creating geothermal systems. What you can see in the Basel is you can see um, a beautiful wing-shaped fracture that, that has occurred and the potential for some shearing along um, a fault plane as these wings grew and aligned with the principal stresses. So uh, natural fractures could have a role depending on the geologic circumstances. So that bearing in mind, let's think about some of the objectives if we're doing a stimulation on uh, one of our forge wells, that first well that was drilled at 65 degrees. So what we want to deal with is we want to um, understand the temperature, understand the potential role of natural fractures. As we were designing this, we wanted to design a pump schedule that made sense to grow fractures that had adequate um, extent for um, uh, this de-risking project. We wanted to monitor each one of these fracture stages with, um, uh, with non-radioactive organic tracers. And we wanted to be sure that we were able to break down these formations and test out standard case and perforating methodologies. Um, so there were a lot of things that we looked at, but one of the first things that we looked at is the availability of fluids to um, inject into these wells. So as, as, as you all know, for the last couple of decades, we've been concentrating in the oil and gas industry and using, largely using slick water, which is water with friction reducer added. And that is, is proven adequate for carrying the concentrations of propent at high enough rate um, for um, shale gas and, and shale oil productivity. However, in this particular situation, uh, we also wanted to try out um, legacy fluids, particularly uh, cross-linked fluids. And one of the fluids that we were testing out was uh, carboxymethylhydroxypropylguar. Um, and you can see from this plot where you're looking at the apparent viscosity at 100, 100 reciprocal seconds, um, and that, that the viscosity degrades with temperature. So the temperature is shown on the right-hand vertical axis, and it's this uh, dashed red line. And this is a laboratory simulation of the fluids where the fluids were tested by Liberty in the laboratory to assess what their rheology was going to be. And you can see that initially there was relatively high viscosity. Um, and with temperature, as expected, that viscosity degraded. And by the time you got down to exposure for a couple of hours, it was basically down to the viscosity of water. But nevertheless, it had some stoutness, uh, some viscosity um, for a period of, of time, and there would be some cool down before this fluid entered the formation. So fluid was an interesting consideration. So we designed a program where we're trying to look at completions, we're trying to look at fluids, and we're pumping it into this well 16A7832, um, right at the very toe of this well. Um, and three stages were pumped. So the first stage was an open hole portion of the well below the casing shoe. And the casing shoe was at 10,787 feet measured depth. And there were 200 feet of open hole and we used slick water. And as I said, the slick water is just water with friction reducer. And this was tagged with one species of organic tracer. The second shoe, we moved into the casing and we perforated the casing above the seven inch shoe. And once again, the fluid was slick water. So the comparison here is slick water open hole, slick water cased hole. And then finally, we moved a little farther up the hole and perforated that hole. And now we're looking at cased and perforated cross link fluid versus stage two, which is cased and perforated slick water. And the aspirations of these treatments and, and what, went in, what went into the pumping was we wanted to have vertical upwards growth on the order of 300 feet. Now we're not advocating that 300 feet is a commercial distance. We're advocating that 300 feet is a distance where we have comfort for this experimental program where we're evaluating connectivity that we can grow a, likely grow a fracture where we can connect the two wells. 
we also want to monitor the microseismicity, not necessarily in, in the vertical plane, but also along the length of the well, to see how closely together we can stage these fractures. Reduced half length is, is probably fine um, be, because we want to circulate, circulate vertically. Um, we, and, and so let's just walk through um, a stage design. We're going to use the first stage sort of as, as a basis for demonstrating the design concepts that went, went um, that we considered. And these design concepts um, uh, were, were uh, first of all, we, we selected slick water for two of the stages. And we selected that because of its operational simplicity, that service companies are familiar with pumping it. We know we can get friction reduction. And uh, we know that this is going to provide us a baseline for when we're comparing with the crosslink fluids. We did not pump propent, and and that's that's not a judgment on whether propent is required or not. Um, that that's a that's a judgment on the fact that we did not want to have any sort of screen out in this in this well under these circumstances. We also had a short test where we pumped at a very low rate trying to look at the potential for shear, st shear stimulation as opposed to extensile fracture growth. Um, and at each stage that we had various rates, and I'll, I'll go into that in a minute, we just allowed things to stabilize so that we could measure the microseismicity. So as I mentioned, um, this is stage one. The other stages were nominally similar. We staged the injection in, and we went in in five barrel per minute increments, and we pump them for long enough that we could see um, uh, stabilized pressure if appropriate um, and, and the, any sort of stabilization in the microseismicity or at least enough time for mic microseismicity to be generated. Um, and we walked the rate up to 50 barrels a minute. Uh, 50 barrels a minute is about, uh, let's say it's about seven cubic meters per minute. Um, and uh, this was based on preliminary modeling that we had done where we wanted to keep the surface pressure below 8,000 PSI uh, because of wellhead constraints. Um, and we maintained the 50 barrel a minute injection rate for 30 minutes so that we could monitor any uh, microseismic cloud. Now, from this step rate, we stepped it up because we didn't quite know what the friction was going to be. We didn't quite know what the near well bore losses were going to be. Plus, it also offered us the potential to calculate um, um, uh, entrance friction um, on, uh, on, on the way up while, while we were loading, uh, while we were creating the fracture. Subsequently, after that 50 barrel a minute stage, which is shown at the top here, and I should have said that rate is shown in blue on the left-hand scale and the pressure and uh, the cumulative volume is shown in red on, on, this, on this scale. 50 barrels per minute for, for 30 minutes and then um, a, a downwards um, step down test to calculate friction um, at, the, at the end of the job. So with step up and step down, we have the potential for comparing friction on the way up and friction on, on, on the way down. As we were doing these treatments, uh, we always had a traffic light system that was in place. Um, and and, and uh, that traffic light system was based on um, a, a network of near and uh, distant uh, um, surface um, seismic network and geophones that were in the well. And uh, we had criteria that were established that if there were a, a certain number of events in, in, a, in a particular period of time, a micro seismic events that is, uh, we would uh, go, to, uh, go from a green light to an orange light, temporarily stop pumping, evaluate what, what was going on. And then we also had criteria for a red light uh, where we would terminate the treatment. We did not come close to either orange or red situations in any of the treatments that we pumped. Nevertheless, uh, a lot of work went into probabilistic surveys of, of, of seismic potential and developing microseismic plans. And a lot of credit goes to um, my colleague, Chris Pankow, for doing a fantastic job in, in that respect. So let's sort of look at what happened when we did these, th these three, three fracks. And I, I wish I could say we're doing things substantially different than we did a long time ago, but really we're not. Um, we're stimulating the 16A well shown up here. We are pumping here 
and the fractures were, were in, in and down here. Um, but we didn't do anything that was tremendously different than we did 40 years previously at Fenton Hill, uh, where we pumped slick water, water with friction reducer. We pumped at an elevated rate, 50 barrels per minute. Now, these days, that a lot of people are pumping higher than that. But back then, that was a big rate. And that was the amount of equipment we brought to location for our work um, on, on the forge site. Pumped at Fenton Hill, pumped just under 6 million gallons, um, a, a large amount of fluid. And we pumped fine material for fluid loss or diversion. And substantially no differences to what you know, conceptually what what is doing today, other than that we did pump one stage with a cross-linked fluid. Now, we had a substantial, as I mentioned, a substantial amount of um, monitoring that was going on, and I won't go into the details, but at, at one time or another, we had between one or three wells with functioning geophones in them. The geophones were struggling because of the elevated temperatures. It, it really made life, life difficult for them. But there was a whole team of, of people from, uh, from, from Schlumberger Geoenergy Suisse, from Avalon, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm missing, and, and, and consultants, Jim Rutledge, uh, who, who were really uh, did yeoman service in terms of keeping these running under these temperatures. So what you're doing with the geophones is fundamentally you're monitoring the breakage of the rock um, um, as the hydraulic fracturing goes on. And by virtue of having multiple welds, you can triangulate onto where these events occurred. And the uh, location of those events tells you chronologically where and when a fracture has, has broken and you can develop a profile. So we'll come back to that because that's a central part of this story. And so uh, the first thing that, that we did is we had to move in a rig. Now this is undesirable and it's not, it's not commonly done these days in conventional fracturing because you can pump down frac plugs and set those frac plugs. But we did, because of temperature, we did not have the ability to uh, um, pump down frac plugs and we didn't, the running tools could not tolerate the temperature, for example. And uh, this also on this, this first test provided the operational flexibility and, and uh, uh, where we could uh, confirm that we were isolating tools and we could do everything um, safely and be sure that we could retrieve all the tools. So we had a rig, we brought in a rig. And the first thing we did is we did a small shear stimulation test in the open hole section. And so what you can see from this is that the red curve is the pressure and it's measured at the surface. Um, and you can see that that has a left-hand scale. And so this is about 3,200 PSI here. On the right-hand vertical scale, it's the pump rate, and that's the solid blue line. And the, the cumulative fluid is shown by the dashed line. And what you can see is pumping at under 20 gallons a minute, and, and that's less than half a barrel a minute. That's a very, very low rate. And we were looking for indications of, of, sheer, of, of sheer stimulation. And we probably didn't see them. I mean, the jury is, is out, but it really looked like we pumped in here, a fracture opened up very easily at a very low rate, and there was not substantial in, in, in indication of, of sliding and microseismic activity. After this was done uh, in the same open hole zone, we moved on to higher rate injection. And once again, you can see that the red curve is the surface pressure indicated on the left-hand vertical axis. The blue curve shows the rate of injection. And I'm saying it's slurry rate, but there was no propent that was pumped. And once again, you can see that this was brought up in stages um, because we didn't completely know what the friction was gonna be in the seven inch casing that we were pumping down, brought to 50 barrels a minute and held constant. And you can see some interesting phenomena here. And, and, and think about the pressure, the, the, the red pressure curve as we compare this with the other two stages. Notice how flat this is at, at oops. Uh, notice how flat this is at, at the top. Um, it's, it, it, it suggests likely that multiple fractures were opening up well, at least one interpretation um, is that multiple fractures were opening up in the open hole, open hole section. We reached 50 barrels a minute um, and the surface pressure was 6,000 PSI and that was below our tolerable wellhead pressure. 
So um, interesting observations for open hole, a relatively flat pressure curve at the surface. It's, it's, going, to, it's going to change a little bit down hole because of um, accounting for friction and hydrostatic head, but it will still be relatively flat and, and, and um, under those circumstances. So we shut in the well, meaning we stopped pumping. We stopped pumping and we left it shut in for four hours. And then after that, we flowed back the well. And this was um, basically a, a reflection of the fact that we were producing hot water to the, to the surface as we flowed this well back. And uh, we flowed that well back for about 16 hours. And uh, after that 16 hours, the uh, flow back energy had uh, deteriorated enough that it was, it was just coming to the surface in spurts. And so we said, well, now it's time to move on to the next, the next set. And so the next set, we uh, needed to isolate that open hole section that we had just fractured uh, from the section above that. And so um, we had searched around a, a long time to find devices to do this because in previous wells, we had, we had a very difficult success with isolation tools. And we found a, a bridge plug that we could set. We had to set it on tubing. And that was one of the reasons that we had um, a rig in place. But nevertheless, um, Interwell out of Norway um, had provided a uh, laboratory confirmation that their devices would tolerate the temperatures and the pressures. And indeed that turned out to be the case. And so you can see here an element, uh, um, an elastomeric element of uh, um, an interwell tool. And you can see that bridge plug being run into the hole on the extreme right. And you can see some drawings of, of, that, of, of that tool um, in the bottom left. So this bridge plug was, uh, um, um, uh, a ball was dropped, uh, we pumped down on it, we set the tool successfully and tested the tool to 7,000 PSI uh, differential pressure. And, and so everything, everything was good setting that. So now you've got a seal, you've got a seal and you've isolated the bottom of the hole that you previously fracked from the upper part of the hole. But remember that this plug, this bridge plug, has been set in casing. And so we would have to perforate the casing to provide connectivity to the reservoir. So we ran a 20-foot perforating gun. Initially, we were going to run 10-foot guns. But uh, we decided that we'd run a longer gun um, to try and, and search for natural fractures. Because in the past, in some zones without natural fractures, we'd have had trouble breaking down. So in this particular zone, we searched for natural fractures and we used a longer gun. And so this gun um, was loaded with uh, shaped charges, um, 21 gram charges, and uh, six of those shots per foot of gun at 60 degrees phasing. That means 60 degree angles are around the well bore in a helical pattern. So that's 120 charges, they all fired. Um, and so we had perforations from 10,560 to 10,580 feet measured depth. So all shots fired <clears throat> and this zone we felt would break down relatively easily because we had um, uh, crossed natural fractures that we had previously mapped. <clears throat> so we pumped this well and the plan was because this time we were pumping down casing that we would and through perforations we'd use a slightly lower rate so in this case, we use 35 barrels a minute, which is maybe four and a half to five cubic meters per minute. And two things that you should notice, well, several things you, you should notice. You can see the pressure curve in blue shown uh, on the right-hand vertical scale, excuse me, the rate curve in blue showing on the right-hand scale and the pressure scale in red shown on the, the left-hand scale. Now notice two things. First of all, notice the decline in surface pressure that's suggesting um, dramatically different um, growth behavior than the open hole section and, and likely vertical growth because of the drop in pressure. And you can see two places where uh, the well was shut in, meaning that we stopped pumping, one near the start and one part way through. The one near the start was used because uh, we, were, we had a group monitoring surface pressure when we shut in from five barrels per minute at the end of the job. And they were monitoring pressure and the micro and, and looking for indications of how the fracture was grown. 
So we wanted to have something at the start of the job to compare with what we had at the end of the job. And so we had a shut in at five barrels per minute. Now, partway through the job, um, it was recommended by uh, Carl Montgomery um, with NSI to do a hard shut in partway through the job at, at the maximum rate and to see if there was any difference in seismicity before and after that shut-in. And it, it turns out that actually there was, or there potentially was, and it, it may shed some, some light on some things. But just keep that in mind, I'm gonna come back to that. So two intentional shut-ins um, at the end of the job, after the final shutdown, uh, we shut in for four hours and we monitored flow back for 12, for 12 hours. So that's two stages pumped. Now uh, we're gonna pump stage three and that's the stage with the cross-linked fluid. So we need to isolate stage two. We need to um, uh, isolate stage two. So we ran in the hole with an interwell bridge plug, set the bridge plug successfully, pressure tested it to 6,800 PSI at the surface. And then subsequently above that bridge plug, we ran back in the hole on our drill pipe and fired guns, um, same, same guns, 20 feet of um, jet, jet perforations that penetrated the casing, the cement, and into the formation, and provided the access to the formation for the fluid that we were pumping. So now let's look at this one. You can see that the pressure decay is even more extreme. Surface pressure in red with the access to the, le the left and rate at maximum 35 barrels per minute um, with the scale on the right. Notice that we also pumped something called deep prop, which is a micro propant. We pumped this in very small concentrations. It is uh, sub, I believe it is sub, is by memory, I believe it is sub 300 mesh material. So it's really, in this case, we probably didn't pump enough to prop. We wanted to pump it in case we came across this material when we were coring through these fractures in the well that were just drilling, um, because it would allow us to be able to discriminate between the natural formation and a man-made material. So um, successfully pumped this stage, we shot it in and uh, floated back for about 15 hours. We flowed back these wells and as as I alluded to, but didn't clarify, we pumped um, a unique organic tracer into each stage of these wells. So that, hey, when we core through these wells, when we drill the production well, as we're doing now, we might see these, these tracers. And so here is, here is a diagram of the tracers, not from the production well that we're drilling, but from the injection well as we're flowing this back. And, as we're flowing back after the third stage in the frac, that's, that's the cross-link frac, you can see that there's a high concentration of, of, of that um, uh, tracer that, that is produced. And then we unseat the bridge plug that is isolating between stage three and stage two. So now we can see the tracer coming back from stage two. And then ultimately we remove the bridge plug isolating stage two and stage one and we can see the, 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 the tracer coming, coming back from that. And so uh, what this suggests to us is that these fractures are far enough apart that they're discrete and they're not interacting. And there's other evidence for that. And that other, other evidence is, is, is fantastic microseismic, microseismic data. Um, now, we're gonna walk through the, the three stages with the microseismic data. And what you can see in the picture at the left is what happened for the microseismicity that was recorded for the first stage. And you can see the colors indicate the chronology that early time are the warm colors and late time are, are the whiter colors. And the blue well is the injection well and the magenta well is the well that we're just drilling now. And so this is, this is an artist's rendition of where that well is going to be. So what do you see? Well, there's, this is the open hole section. This is, this is where the fluid was going into, but we see very little microseismicity there. I mean, and, and, and these, the folks at Geoenergy Suisse who, who, who have processed these data just did a fantastic job. It's an outstanding data set, but we only see limited microseismicity um, 
through here. And in all stages, the microseismicity never exceeded magnitude 0.5. But the interesting thing about this is we don't see any coming out of the toe where we did the injection. But later on in the job, what we start to see is we start to see microseismicity growing back on an inclined feature. So it's seeing, probably seeing some sort of natural fracture growing back towards the well. So very, very interesting behavior from this, but not a great story for injecting into a significant open hole section. Stage two, you recall stage two. This was slick water pumped at 35 barrels per minute through cased and perforated, a little farther up the well bore. And you can see um, a, a nice microseismic cloud. It's somewhat, somewhat diffuse. And that probably makes sense based on the fact that the slick water can enter any sort of pre-existing natural fractures. Finally, we see a beautiful stage three fracture, the crosslink fluid. And it's a little more planar, probably because even uh, with the degradation due to the temperature, the viscous losses going into the natural fractures um, precluded entry into them. And it was a relatively planar feature that, that occurred in that fracture. At least that's one interpretation. And so this is, this is a side view. This is an elevation view. Um, and here's a plan view of all three of these, well, so an elevation and a map view of these together. And so you know, you can see particularly stage three, just a, just an astounding data set. Interesting thing about stage three is you can see a little bit of bifurcation occurring. And so right this morning, we're coring right in here, or right where we think is in here. Um, and and we'll, see, we'll see what happens um, as we core and ultimately do circulation tests between the wells. So, Beautiful microseismic data, fractures mapped, looks promising for drilling the second well 300 feet vertically above. And now I just wanna go back for one second to stage two. And you recall in stage two, we had three hard shutdowns. And if you look at this plot, you can see uh, the red lines indicating um, um, triggered um, um, seismic activity. And so here the blue curve, is the pressure is, is is the pressure, and the black curve is the rate. And so the rate goes to zero. We shut in, the pressure drops. Classic shut in, pressure decay. We started back up, and there's a potential indication that after that restart, there's less microseismicity. And so this this may have implications in terms of of, of introducing cyclic stimulation. Um, some of my colleagues who have interpreted the microseismic data have told me to hold my horses that we probably were, uh, we needed to inject longer because we were bringing down, the, as you can see, we were bringing down the rate at the same time. Nevertheless, there's a, there's a possibility that, that there can be some alternative stimulation technologies that could have value. So, some of the key learnings and successes, and, and there's a lot of repetition here, and, and I apologize, but we had very strong performance from the bridge plugs. We, we would prefer to have tools that could, be, that could be pumped down and that we didn't have a rig on location. And, and there are some options. Um, as a matter of fact, on the well that we're, we're drilling, we're gonna try out Schlumberger's copper head uh, to see if we can set it in 38 pound casing. It was designed for 35 pound casing, so we'll see but it is a trial that we're anticipating doing in the next month or so as we drill to TD. But um, looking at methodologies for increasing operational efficiency is, is really something that, 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 that is important. And uh, we also learned, and it's, it's a separate discussion, I don't, I'm, I don't presume to be an expert, but there are people online that can answer, um, are looking for ruggedized geothermal, uh, excuse me, geophone packages that can tolerate the temperatures. Um, interesting technical observations, the lack of microseismicity um, in, the, in the open hole section. And frankly, uh, that's, that's a very interesting section because we also see that fracture growing back towards the well bore. And that's been seen a little bit in the oil field. Um, there's, there's a nice paper by Kerr et al. Um, we had demonstrated very nice control with cased and perforated operations, and we were able to break these down effectively. 
Um, I see a potential for viscosified fluids. I think in the future we'll be testing out propants, and so the we'll need fluids that can carry those um, uh, effectively. And cyclic stimulation, the potential for prop, and all of these things need to be investigated further. And connectivity will 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 have some information on that within uh, the next little while because of the well that we're drilling. And so in terms of that well, that well we're drilling, we're currently drilling the 16B well, and that well is right at this particular point here now, as you can see on, on the right-hand side, where we're at a depth of about 9,800 feet, coring through our best estimate of where the microseismic cloud uh, will be intersected by that well. So we should know shortly um, what's going on. And so from this well and our goals all together is that our first goal here is to establish connectivity or to determine methods that we need to improve um, uh, connectivity. Uh, then the next stage will be conductivity. What sort of conductivity do these fractures have? Um, is propent required? There's still a debate on uh, whether shear stimulation is effective. I mean, I think there's little doubt that there are shear fractures occurring um, as, as part of the injection, but there's likely dominant extensile features or reopening of pre-existing natural fractures that are playing a significant role. And then certainly conformance, the ability to pump equally into, into the individual multiple fractures along the length of the well is going to be a big deal. So a lot of things to establish in the future. And, uh, and I think I can just, I, I've probably covered most, most of these questions here. We're looking at how complicated are these fractures? How can you control them? Uh, what kind of, frankly, what kind of fracture do you want to create? Uh, hydraulic shearing remains an unknown and what sort of degree of conduct connectivity are we going to get? And then you go on to conductivity. What sort of propent do we need to pump? Is propent appropriate? What sort of near bore well bore effects? We saw significant near well bore effects, particularly in stage three, and we like to comprehend, comprehend those. So many, many things that this, this FORGE program provides the opportunity to de risk these tools, understand the technology, and promote the commercialization of this type of geothermal and geothermal in general. And so, in terms of that, I'd like to express our, our significant gratitude to the Department of Energy, um, the uh, uh, Geothermal Technologies Office. We also have many sta stakeholders, including Smithfield, uh, CITLA uh, within the state of Utah has, has been a fantastic collaborator and as have the Beavers, Be Beaver County and, and the folks in, in Milford City itself. And finally, uh, thank the um, Governor's Office of Energy Development and Utah's congressional delegation. So I'll, I'll do my best to try and answer questions, but I, I know I have uh, assistance lurking in the background on this call. So Jennifer, I don't know whether you want to handle the questions or I can just go through. Uh, yeah, the, the first question was from Jennifer. Hi, John, need any help with anything? Well, <laughs> obviously I did. <laughs> uh, can you see the questions in the chat? Uh, I'm I'm just getting there, Joe. Although, uh, have you considered hosting this on a different? Okay. No, we have not. Um, how long do you expect the fracks to be open? Um, we don't expect the fracks to be substantially open, although we do expect a little bit of residual conductivity. Um, you know, no matter. No matter what one thinks, there is there is going to be um, some mismatch, and the fractures won't close completely. But uh, um, that remains an, an open question. You, you know, if you can have self propping occurring, and that self propping can overcome the tendency to creep in a, in a hot, highly stressed environment, then then maybe you don't even need propping. But otherwise, you may need propping to keep these fractures open and adequately conducted. The um, uh, De Denise um, is asking, how will the production well be completed? And um, the production well is going to have an open hole section. Um, and above that open hole section, the production well is going to be cased and perforated. Um, in, in the, uh, but be before we case and perforate that well, 
uh, the University of Texas and, and Shell and uh, Rice University and Celixa will be in within the next month or so, we'll be running three fiber optic cables in that well and we'll be cementing those, those, those cables in place. And so we will have a situation where uh, at, at, uh, the ultimate completion of that well will be by perforating but that will follow um, mapping of, of where those fibers are going to be. And that will follow uh, a, a new fracturing campaign in, uh, in the original injection well um, that will be uh, orchestrated by University of Texas, Professor Sharma and Jack Norbeck and his colleagues at, at FERVO will also be uh, working on helping us with stimulation programs there. Um, uh, and, and then maybe it's, I don't know whether it's a repeated, yeah, Herman, I, 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 I think these fractures are nominally closed um, and, and they, they'll have to be hydraulically reopened or, or propped in, in a commercial situation. Um, Doug Hollett, uh, Doug's wondering about equate, the, equating the surface or exfoliation type fractures with subsurface fractures. Any work on, on that? No, Doug. Um, well, there's been a lot of work on those fractures. Um, um, uh, the, 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 the offset surface fractures, and I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but um, to the um, Idaho National Labs, Itasca, and, and AGI, and Golder have spent a lot of time looking at. Uh, um, as, as well as the geology department at the University of Utah have, look, have spent a lot of time mapping surface and, and, and uh, underground fractures um, in, and, and building DFNs. Um, oh, that, that doesn't answer your question. So um, we, we may have exfoliation fractures occurring in situ. Um, and, and maybe this isn't answering your question either, but I'll take a crack at it. You know, one of the people that one of the things that people have looked at is is what happens with um, thermal cooling of these wells. And you know, to drill these wells, we are we have chillers to drill the wells. And and so with with that occurring, you're going to have breakouts. You're going to have exfoliation. We have not seen a substantial amount of breakouts, uh, at least on the 16A well. We we've seen a few, um, but nothing substantially. Um, I, I don't know, Doug. If, if you want to unmute yourself and, and specifically ask ask a question, uh, because I don't think I'm answering it. Yeah, John, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Re, re, the question is really um, with that. You know, the density of fractures that you're seeing in those surface outcrops. I'm just wondering um, the extent to which that replicates the, the fracture density in the subsurface. Uh, I I I think that I I think it is 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 a reasonable representation of of what we indeed we are seeing in the subsurface, but you know, the interesting thing about that is, it, is that in the subsurface, as we drill these wells, we basically take no losses whatsoever. And so uh, those, those fractures are, and, and people can answer this better than I, um, those fractures are largely healed and, and, and not taking fluid. Um, I also am of the opinion, and, and not everyone agrees with me, that, that sometimes our, our imaging techniques are seeing um, short thermally induced fractures that won't contribute substantially to um, um, overall stimulation or instability. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Gary is correct. Rosemont Alley is in Cornwall. Um, Colin, what was done to check that the natural fractures do not conduct fluid and, and hydraulic fracturing uh, was necessary? Um, in, in uh, a number of uh, earlier wells, vertical wells, um, we, did, we did pilot testing, Colin, and, and basically these were completely tight and we had to break the formation down and actually create hydraulic fracturing before the, the formation would take fluid. So we don't necessarily know how these natural fractures contribute to the overall uh, fracturing process, but we have to apply hydraulic pressure that's exceeding the in-situ stresses to start the ball rolling and to create some sort of uh, um, interconnected conductive network. Um, 
yeah um so uh the next question is how was the how, what is the stress profile in the area and so um we, we have run uh, ex extensive uh um sonic scanner and 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 similar logging um protocols and and from that data done done our best effort to forecast um stress profiles from logs and calibrate these with a number of defit tests in multiple offset wells and um, from that testing um, the 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 vertical and and the intermediate principal stresses uh, the minimum and 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 the vertical print principal stress are constrained fairly well vertical being 1.13 psi per foot the minimum somewhere in the range of 0.74 to 0.78 PS, psi per foot. Uh, the intermediate principal horizontal principal stress is um, a subject of continued de debate as, as it is in, in many cases. And so um, the, 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 stress, the stress profile was, in, was um, uh, inferred by logging and in situ stressing and defit testing or, or, or micro, micro hydraulic fracturing testing in addition to defit testing. Um, we uh, we determined the depth to land this well based on our inference of, of temperature. One of the constraints that we had from the DOE program was that we had to have a temperature somewhere in, uh, north of 175 degrees C. And based on um, our, our pilot wells um, drilled to those depths and, and uh, the thermal profiling that was done there, we determined what the, what the temperatures were. And so we drilled the temperature. Um, in in this particular case, and and frankly, we drilled to a temperature that was hot enough to be challenging, but not too hot to uh, um, make make life impossible. And so, somewhere in the range of 235 degrees C was the the, the toe of this particular well. Um, let's see. Uh, Ian, um, did flowback rate and temperature tell you anything about the fractures, the, 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 the stimulation fluid created and entered? Um, flowback is, 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 is a very popular topic with us. It, it, is, it has told us some really important things. I'm not sure it told us a great deal about the, the geometry of the fracture, but um, it, it brought some surprises to the geochemical folks in terms of the in terms of the composition of the fluids that were produced back. And um, my colleagues will be better to answer that than I if we need if if, if we go there. But there there was more um, um, dissolved solids than uh, than than we were definitely anticipating. However, one of the interesting things about uh, about flowback that we're really strongly advocating is using some form of flowback in, uh, in defit measurements. And we did a lot of testing here where we did conventional defits and we would shut in for 20 hours or whatever. And uh, we compared that with defits that we did with flowback cycles or with flowback. And we found that the flowback cycles allowed us to do the defit in a couple of hours as opposed to you know a day or, or, or half a day or whatever. So I'm a strong advocate for um, adapting flowback for other other technologies. Um, as to the exact geometry of the fracture, we use the flowback from the defit testing to try and understand the in situ stresses. Um, but we didn't pretend we don't we don't advocate we don't know how it, it it tells us what the geometry specific geometry of the fractures. We have another question um, about what sort of modeling was used, and as as I've mentioned, um, Idaho National Labs. Um, Itasca and Golder and, and EGI collaborated extensively to use um, uh, discrete fracture network modeling to uh, uh, come up with predictions of what sort of vertical extent we would have in the hydraulic fractures that we've created. So we're recognizing that there's a substantial DFN and Golder did a fantastic job building this DFN from all of the information that, that was, was available. And I, Itasca and, and INL have taken this information and with, with parametric variation in the mechanical properties of the fractures in particular, um, hydromechanical properties of the fractures in particular, they've come up with um, 
very good predictions uh, and both a priori and post facto of, of what the fracture systems look like. So um, we've been leaning towards using discrete fracture network models now. And I believe also on the other hand, our colleague Mark McClure from ResFrac has published on using um, uh, the ResFrac code for modeling the stage three stimulation as well. Um, what else we got? Uh, what was the reason to choose the prop and that was choosing right in, in stage three? Um, e e yes. Um, so so uh, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say your name wrong, but Priyavrat. Um, uh, good, great question. So we did not want to run um, 40, 70, uh, uh, um, even 100 mesh, um, because we really did not know what to expect in terms of the entrance losses. And as, as you can see from stage three, we have some near well bore losses that we can't necessarily explain. So we did not want to risk screen out by running substantial concentrations um, or uh, high, high quantities of um, uh, or, or large diameter problems. But we did, um, at, at the recommendation of Steve Cobb from NS, uh, from Premier, excuse me, um, uh, Steve was, was advocating for running some sort of man-made profit because of the experience that they'd had in um, some, some of the HFTS work or, or people that had in the HFTS work, where it was difficult to tell the difference between sand and, um, uh, and, and formation. Now we wouldn't pump sand anyways because it, it probably wouldn't last. Well, it, these temperatures would be borderline, but we just wanted to pump something that we could uh, that was small enough that it wouldn't risk um, screen out, wouldn't contribute substantially to fluid loss control because of the concentrations we're using. But if we got it into the fractures that we cored through, maybe we maybe we would be able to see it. And, and so nothing more sophisticated than that. Uh, Jesse, I, I think I addressed that. We were using discrete fracture network modeling and also ResFrac modeling has been done independently. This is correct. We, we do not know if we had injected, you know, if we had injected longer, it, it, the, the 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 drop in the injection the the drop in the surface pressure there um, Priyavrat, um, was was due to the declining rates. If we had maintained the rates higher, that may have picked up. So it's it's unknown, but it's just something that we all want to think about in terms of the potential for um, cyclic injection to having the potential to mitigate micro seismicity. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're, we're trying hard to process the micro size, Herman, we're trying hard to process the micro seismic data so that we can see what sort of, what, what sort of uh, micro seismic events were, were occurring. But at the, at the present time, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna reserve judgment on how many of those fracture systems were mode two. Okay, are you planning to do more stimulation later on the same well? Yes. It, um, it will be, um, Denise, it will be further up the hole. Um, and, and as I said, um, we have campaigns that are planned, one or more campaigns that are planned uh, with collaboration with uh, Professor Sharma at, at the University of Texas and our colleagues at, at, at Fruvo Energy who, who actually have the acreage rex, right next door to us at, at Forge. Um, we can keep going, uh, let's see. Ah, Nancy, what kind of drilling fluids were used for this high temperature? Very good question. Very good. And it, it's an interesting question. Um, we're using straight water. And uh, uh, we have found in, in, in the initial wells, we were, we were mudding up. And, um, but as we drilled some supplementary wells, um, we, we tried going to straight water. And with, with the straight water, that was under the advice of, of um, um, uh, Professor Fred Dupriest and Professor Sam Neuner from Texas A&M University. And we, we, we went to straight water because the, the water would help uh, um, dis, disaggregate um, packs of um, um, 
broke of, of cuttings that were being pushed by, by the cutters. And it has worked extremely well. And so in this particular reservoir, where we don't have losses, as, as I said, we, you know, this, this reservoir is, is actually in some ways forgiving. It's hot, it's abrasive, um, it's at high strength, but there are no losses. And so we can drill with water and water has worked very, very effectively for us, straight water. It presumably, and Herman, presumably the features at the surface are, um, are, are reflecting relaxation. Yes, um, and, and, but potentially they are also uh, relaxation on, on, on incipient fractures or healed fractures. Um, I think John is asking um, a comparison between EGS and, 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 um, and closed loop. And, and I think that, um, uh, my, my sense is 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 that these each of these technologies has, has a place in our in our business, and we will we will uh, um, they, they will both mature to to some extent, but possibly for different uh, different applications. Um, yes, David. David is asking: Is the microseismic point cloud data in the public domain? If so, how, how can one get a hold of it? Um, it, it is in the, in, in, and Joe Moore can correct me if I'm wrong, it's in the geothermal data repository. Uh, you are correct. And in the GDR or go to our website, you, you can find some wiki pages and that will provide you links to the data. Oh, so so Key Bachman is, is asking for, uh, what what the specifics of of the uh, um, seismic mag magnitudes are for the uh, orange and red lights? So um, for, for for orange, um, uh, we would have um, a, a magnitude two would take us to would take within three kilometers would take us to orange. We'd also go to orange if we had ten magnitude ones within a twenty four hour period, um, and and that's more applicable to. Um, say a twenty, um, a long-term injection test, and if we had a magnitude three or greater, we would go to red. We also, based on the experience at Pohang, um, uh, we were looking at situations where if if we had losses that we couldn't cure in thirty minutes, we would stop and go to orange and, and figure out what what was going on. Uh, so so during during the the, the drilling. Um, Ah, uh, okay. So, so um, Jesse is asking um, uh, about about spacing. Um, so, and and I, Jesse, I honestly can't remember the exact spacing, but these were relatively a long ways apart, and we intentionally put them far apart so that we would not have interactions between these fractures. And so, um, we're talking about between two and four hundred feet apart, and we did not see interaction uh, and our clusters, we just had single stages, single clusters for each of these frac stages. So they'd be nominally single or uh, single fractures would, would, would probably ultimately dominate or single fracture system would actually dominate. And we were 200 to 400 feet apart and we don't believe we saw significant interaction. So the sense is that we will be able to move these closer together. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things we'll want to do. We'll want to move these closer together. We'll, we'll likely be, be, University of Texas and, and FERWA will likely be advocating uh, cluster technologies. And, 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 and so we'll see how close we can push them together uh, before we have interactions that degrade the, um, degrade or improve the circulation of fluid from one well to, the, to, to another. Um, well, Matt, I, I, I don't know whether we will or not. I mean, um, Matt, Matt's asking if, if we expect changes in the fracture geometry when we re-stimulate the injection well. Well, we'll, we'll be isolating the, the three fracs that, that, that we did. And, and you know, if I look at, it, at the seismic profile, the microseismic profile for stage three, I'm, I'm going to anticipate that um, 
um, that that fracture is relatively planar. I think the first two may be less so, but it looks like stage three is a relatively planar fracture. Uh, that being said, it may be enfranchising natural fractures in, in, a, in a planar network. And we can get relatively close to that without interfering substantially. But um, once again, as with many things in this, we'll, we'll wait and see as we do that. But I, I think I think we can. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that will influence them substantially. Now, um, that being said, there there may be some mechanical shadowing uh, that that we may be pushing on them a little bit, but that'll be hard to tell. Um, we the Bashish. Um, um, is, is wondering if, if was the, the sonic scanner data used um, to get an estimation of, of maximum horizontal stress. And so we used the sonic scanner in some of these wells and, and we used a conventional di a more conventional dipole sonic in, 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 uh, in, in other scenarios. And, and actually when we ran the dipole sonic, we ran it through tubing to overcome the, the, the thermal issues because we, we were able to circulate um, the, the tubing into the hole. And yes, indeed, um, that is our that is forming our best estimate of what the maximum horizontal stress is, and it's somewhere between 0.74 and 1.13 psi per foot. Um, still remaining a little bit nebulous. Um, Jesse, again, from what you have seen thus far, <laughs> oh, don't make me answer this. Uh, um, I, I, I'm I'm thinking um, 150 feet maximum. We might be able to shrink it a little bit, but I, I, that, that's that's just a gut feeling rather than any sort of um, experimental work. And and that's that's what we'll do is we'll experiment and try and see what sort of spacing uh, we can tolerate. Um, I think I've, I think I answered that question. Uh, GDR, the microseismic data is available, in G, and there it is, Sean Lattice, um, uh, who's who's uh, our R and D program manager at Forge, has posted a link to that. Uh, okay, and, and one more, John. Do, do you see the question? Uh, in your opinion, is cement or open hole packers optimal for isolation? I was trying to ignore that question. Oh, that's an interesting one. No, no. It's an important question. It, it, it's, it's an important question. Uh, I, I've, and, and if I offer a personal opinion, uh, I've offered, I offer the personal opinion that I would like to see cased and perforated or possibly sliding sleeves um, um, because ultimately we're going to want to be able to control these fractures. Um, and, it, you know, right now we're looking at connectivity and and the next step conductivity. But as, as I mentioned previously, conformance and equality of flow in all of these fracture systems is gonna require control of these fractures, not only at the injection well, but at the production well. Not, not everybody agrees me, with me, uh, on, on, certainly on the production well side, but I believe that um, if we can control the growth of the, of, the, of the fractures by possibly even manipulating our fracturing program simultaneously on the injection and production well, we can develop a, a network that we can control. And um, my, my opinion is, is a cased hole with cement is, is, is appropriate, but um, I, I think the jury, the jury may still be out on that. What role will, will tracers play? So, so Terence, um, uh, you know, tracers and tracers will will help to tell us what the connectivity is in the fractures. So, as I as I mentioned, we uh, injected a unique tracer into each one of the three fracture stages, and we're trying to core through right now each one of those stages. And so, we're uh, we're going to look for tracer in in the one zone. We'll look for micropropant. We'll look for indications of hydraulic fractures that may be difficult to tell. Um, uh, and, and, and that's one side. The second, the second thing is that um, after we complete the, the second well, well 16B in, in a month or so, 
um, and even less possibly, we're going to be doing circulation tests where we'll be pumping into the original injection well and into uh, and and recovering in the production well. And so we'll be monitoring tracer output as, from that. So we'll have some indication of uh, uh, of what zones are are producing fluid. We'll also be running high temperature production logging um, in the injection well and in the production well. And during the circulation testing, we'll be bullheading um, a, a, another organic tracer down the injection well so that we can we can try and just see something about the connectivity. But we're hoping from the tracers to be able to tell something about the effectiveness of the connectivity and which fractures are producing. Um, any further questions? Well, if that's the case, I, I, I'd like to really thank everybody. Um, got off to a bit of a rough start, but uh, it, it was a, um, a fun presentation. And if anybody else has questions, um, really don't hesitate to uh, communicate with any of the people at, at, at the FORGE team.